<laughs> Every year, the Wikimedia Foundation receives a number of requests either asking to remove or alter content or to unmask users for their participation on the Wikimedia projects. We're going to go through a few stories about how we've received these, uh, the types of requests that we've received and how they've turned out. But first, let's do a broad overview of um, just a six month time period last year. So first, our alteration and removal requests. These are requests that come to us either informally or through legal process that um, basically demand that we alter content on the Wikimedia projects or completely remove it. This can be complete articles, um, things on Wikisource, it can be a photo on Commons, um, it just kind of depends on the request and they come from around the world. Next is DMCA takedown notices. This is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act um, takedown notice system. And basically these requests are claiming that there is copyright infringement somewhere on the projects and asking for their removal. Um, with DMCA notices, it's, we heavily respect copyright, um, just as members of the community do. And in fact, we have relatively few DMCA requests compared to most websites because of the vigilance of the community. But we do still receive a handful of them. Um, and while we do believe we should take down legitimate copyright infringement, um, the DMCA system is sometimes abused and we get fraudulent or overbroad requests um, for removal. So we do fight back. As you can tell, we only granted nine of the 20 that we got in that six month period. And next, the right to be forgotten, which has been a subject uh, heavily discussed already and I will talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, we only get a handful of direct requests. Most requests go directly to search engines rather than the foundation, but the handful that we do get, we have uh, rejected. And last, um, user data. This, these are requests either informal or through legal process um, where individuals or governments will ask for um, any user data that we are holding on specific users, usually as a, um, in an attempt to file either a civil claim or a criminal action against that user. Um, as you can tell, we fight back pretty heavily on these because we believe in the privacy of our users and protecting them so that they can contribute to, to free, the free knowledge movement unimpeded. So, while the vast majority of cases and disagreements on the projects are successfully handled and negotiated with the community itself, a handful of them do escalate up to full-on litigation, and I'm gonna tell you about a few of these. First, the NSA. As many of you have heard, um, last March, we, along with eight co-plaintiffs and represented pro bono by the American Civil Liberties Union, filed a suit against the, national, um, the U.S. National Security Agency. I'm going to briefly go through the basics of the case for those of you who haven't heard much about it yet. Um, we sued the NSA and related governmental um, offices for their large-scale search and seizure of internet communications um, under the surveillance program that's referred to as upstream surveillance. Upstream surveillance involves the tapping um, of the internet's infrastructure or backbone um, to intercept substantially all international and at least some domestic text-based communications. Our aim in filing the suit was to end this mass surveillance program in order to protect the rights of our users around the world. We believe that the NSA has not only exceeded the scope of their statutory authority, but have violated the public's right of free expression and privacy. Freedom of expression and association, access to knowledge and privacy, enable inquiry and dialogue and the creation. And these principles are central to the Wikimedia vision of empowering everyone to share the sum of all human knowledge. When, we are in when th these principles are endangered, our mission is threatened. If people have to look over their shoulder before they're searching and pause before contributing to controversial articles or refrain from sharing verifiable but unpopular information, we are all the worse for it. So what's going on recently? Um, in September of 2015, we, heard, we had a district court hearing and unfortunately in October, the district court decided to dismiss our case on standing grounds. Um, we respectfully disagree with the court and somewhat anticipated this ruling. 
Um, and as a result, in December, we filed an appeal with the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, we, in recent months, have been completing the briefing documents um, that are required for that, and we're, a hearing date has not been yet set, but we're expecting a hearing date to be set and oral arguments to be done in the fall. Um, if you want to learn more about this case, or if you want to get an NSA uh, for Stop Surveillance sticker, um, please see us after. You can learn more at policy.wikimedia.org slash stop surveillance. So the uh, case of Elizabeth Tessier was a case where a French uh, fortune teller sued the WMF uh, for hosting an article that included uh, a fairly detailed biography about her, uh, including a number of references to predictions she had made that were incorrect. Um, Tessier did not actually challenge the accuracy of the article, but she uh, filed <laughs> suit under French defamation law, saying that uh, it was essentially not written in a way that was appropriate and that she was supposed to be given a right of reply. Uh, we initially won this case on procedural grounds last year at the French district court level. Uh, essentially, the court at that time said that she had simply waited too long to file a lawsuit. Um, however, she decided to appeal that, um, and we just recently had the uh, appeals court hearing and uh, briefing, and then that court decided to hear some of the merits of the lawsuit rather than dismiss on procedure. Uh, and that court ruled also in our favor. Um, it held that the Wikimedia Foundation was a hosting provider, which is very important for French precedent. It means that the foundation is not liable for all of the content and can't be forced to change things that all of the volunteers have written. Uh, the court also noted that the article was in fact uh, what it called legitimate criticism of the divinatory arts, uh, and therefore <coughs> held that she did not have a claim in that case. <laughs> So not all lawsuits against the movement are against the foundation. This example is a case against Wikimedia Sweden. Some time ago, Wikimedia Sweden launched an open database that provides maps, descriptions, and photos of works of art that are permanently located in public places around Sweden to help people more easily explore the important sites and works. Some of these works are still under copyright protection, However, Swedish copyright law recognizes a concept known as the freedom of panorama. Freedom of panorama is the idea that one can take a photo of buildings or works of art, depending on the country, um, that are situated in public places without infringing upon the copyright of that work or building. Unfortunately, a Swedish copyright association called BUS, um, who represents some of the artists whose work was photographed and displayed on Wikimedia Sweden's database, felt that their copyright was infringed and sued Wikimedia Sweden. They argued that Sweden's freedom of panorama didn't extend to publication of any photos taken online. Um, this is generally a confusing concept. You can take the photo and they thought that was okay, but actually sharing it in specifically online, they said crossed a line. The foundation believes that public works of art should be accessible to all, even those that cannot travel to the location of that art. So the foundation partnered with Wikimedia Sweden through the Defense of Contributors program and fought the lawsuit. Because this extension of online publication um, was genuinely ambiguous in Swedish copyright law, Wikimedia Sweden and BUS together um, asked the Swedish Supreme Court to review the matter. The Swedish Supreme Court unfortunately ended up ruling against Wikimedia Sweden, determining that Freedom of Panorama, Panorama did not permit them to post the images of these works online. However, the court also limited the scope of the ruling, um, so that means that it only applies to Wikimedia Sweden's site. Unfortunately, we still do not know when online publications may be appropriate. Um, currently, the Swedish Supreme Court referred the case back down to the district court where we are continuing to fight the case on other grounds. Uh, so the case of Evelyn Schells uh, is actually a privacy lawsuit that we received. Uh, I had not anticipated we'd be, have a perfect example of this, but uh, <laughs> she sued us because the Wikipedia article about her had her birth date on it. Um, Schells herself is a notable person. She is a German film director and writer. 
Um, and I think that this case actually identifies, importantly, the, how the method of obtaining uh, information that could be private makes a very big difference. Because in this case, uh, the court ruled in our favor. Uh, and the reason that the court ruled in our favor is that the birth date was obtained from Shells herself. She had published her dissertation. Uh, and when she published her own book, she gave out her birth date. And it was felt that that information was helpful to illustrate the article about her and you know, give readers an understanding of what time she came from. So the court held that it was in fact not private information because she herself had published it. Um, I think in other contexts, for example, if no one had known that information or if it had been different private information where people were you know, violating the law to obtain that private information or engaging in very invasive investigative journalism, uh, there might have been a different result in the case. But because she herself gave that information out, it simply didn't fall into that category of privacy. Uh, she's currently considering appeal, an appeal, uh, but it is very unlikely that she will be successful. Um, a different and somewhat more difficult, next one, a different and somewhat more difficult German case that we uh, have been dealing with is the city of Mannheim Russ, Rice Engelhorn Museum. I apologize to all the German speakers in the audience. Um, <laughs> versus the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, this lawsuit deals with. Uh, pictures of pictures, where the originals are in the public domain. So the museum had its employee, a photographer, take photographs of many of its paintings. Uh, those paintings are old, many of them are from the 1800s. Uh, the one particularly famous one is a portrait of Richard Wagner, which was used to illustrate his article in a number of different languages of Wikipedia. Uh, and what the museum asserted was that they owned the pictures of the pictures. Uh, we argued that because these were just faithful reproductions of works in the public domain, uh, that there should not have been a new copyright created. Uh, in addition, the museum had forbidden photography in the museum, and so we argued that by essentially claiming ownership of the pictures they had taken and then preventing anyone else from taking any pictures, they were trying to create a new copyright in works in the public domain themselves. Uh, we unfortunately lost the case at the lower level in Germany. Uh, this was somewhat expected because Germany has a slightly broader neighboring right than uh, some other countries when it comes to copyright. Germany, in addition to awarding copyright that is life of the author plus 70 years for creative works, also has a shorter duration copyright of, I believe, 20 years in length for works that are due to some kind of expertise or skill uh, such as, in this particular case, taking a photograph that required uh, exact angle, lighting, and perhaps filtering in order to get the colors correct. Uh, we respectfully disagree with the court's decision in, that, uh, in this aspect and think that they didn't fully consider the impact this has on the public domain. And so we are uh, planning to, and I believe have begun to, actually file an appeal in this case and take it to the higher courts in Germany. Uh, some good news in this case, though, is that the uh, city and the museum had actually sued uh, Wikimedia Deutschland as well, and the court dismissed that aspect of the suit, ruling that uh, the chapter did not have any special powers to you know, make changes on the site or otherwise uh, change these pictures, and therefore dismissed the lawsuit against them. All right, that, uh, finishing with the litigation, we want to talk a little bit about some legal issues and broader trends that we've been seeing in the law. And the first area we're going to talk about is issues in copyright, uh, as those are certainly very important for all of the projects. So the first issue that we want to talk about is actually continuing from the Rice uh, Englehorn Museum suit. There's been a trend that we've seen this year of attempts to recapture uh, things that are in the public domain in Europe. And this is both uh, older works as well as some more recent works. So older works, in addition to the German case, uh, we've also had some requests coming out of Spain to remove images of very old public domain art. Uh, we've gotten requests to remove some pictures painted by uh, Raphael from the Renaissance, uh, arguing that because those images were owned by uh, a museum, that they could not be posted uh, online by the foundation. Uh, so far, we have been fighting those. We've not done any removals of these uh, types of pictures, but uh, it is certainly a concern, and there's a possibility that there'll be more litigation over these. Uh, more recent issues have been uh, photographs in, I believe, Italy and Finland. Uh, similar to Germany, many countries in Europe have a more limited photographic right uh, that is 
for photographs that are of a factual nature, things like uh, portraits of people. And a lot of those pictures from the 1950s through the 1970s fell into the public domain uh, and were in the public domain in both Europe and the United States, so they're on Wikipedia. However, we have received this year some claims from certain photography companies claiming that, in fact, these photographs of portraits were actually artistic works that should have received uh, life of the author plus 70 years protection, uh, and therefore asserting that we have to remove them from the, anywhere they're used on the projects. Uh, so far, we have also denied those requests, and none of them have developed into litigation yet, but this is an area where we're seeing uh, more activity than in the past, and so we're watching it closely. So another area that we want to talk about, uh, some of you may already know about this, is that we unfortunately had to remove the diary of Anne Frank from Wikipedia this year. Uh, this was a very, it was actually removed from Wikisource, to correct that. This was a very sad example of the overreach of US copyright law. Um, as some people may know, the exact copyright status of the Diary of Anne, Diary of Anne Frank has been subject to debate. Uh, there have been arguments that it passed into the public domain in the Netherlands at the beginning of 2016. Um, but regardless of whether that was accurate or not, uh, the diary has copyright in the United States until uh, I believe the year 2043, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and that is because of the trade agreements, the Euro trade agreements that were made in the early 90s, which granted a full US copyright duration to all works that were uh, a treaty partner of the United States and still under copyright at that time. And the Diary of Anne Frank definitely falls under that. Um, because of that, once we determined that it was under copyright, we were in a very unique situation uh, in dealing with the diary in this case. Uh, it's an extremely famous work uh, and had been pointed out to us as being on Wikisource. Um, and not only had it been pointed out to us, but it had also been uh, the subject of communications with the legal department specifically, and we had even been asked to evaluate whether it was uh, in the public domain or not. Um, and because of that level of detailed communication, the actual legal evaluation that had been required of us, when we determined that it was still copyrighted, uh, we were under an obligation in United States law to remove it from the projects. We don't see this as a, the type of case that would come up very often, and in fact, it may even be a unique case on the projects. But it's still an extremely unfortunate one. Um, a third copyright case that came up this year is one of the very rare examples of a DMCA counter notice that we've had. Uh, the counter notice process is a process by which uh, a user or uh, anyone involved in a case can file to uh, put something that has been removed under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act back up on the web unless somebody starts a lawsuit. Um, in, this in this particular case, the request was from the Bernie Sanders campaign. They wanted uh, their campaign logos removed from the site. Uh, when they initially contacted us, I actually warned them that this would probably go very poorly because even if they had a claim under the law, the removal would get a lot of press and be subject to the Streisand effect where people would notice and actually get pretty upset about it. Uh, they nevertheless insisted and we felt that the logos were in something of a legal gray area when we were initially evaluating it. They were fairly simple, but they had just enough artistic elements that we thought they might have been subject to copyright, so we granted that DMCA. However, uh, when the counter notice was filed and then we put the, uh, we informed the campaign, they withdrew their DMCA request and so we put the images back up immediately. We also used this opportunity to do additional and more in-depth research into the issue of copyrightability of logos and have updated the WikiLegal article talking about this with uh, information about some of the more recent cases, especially in the Ninth Circuit where the Wikimedia Foundation is located, uh, in order to give a better understanding for users about what types of content can uh, be used on the projects. So, you guys have heard a lot about this already from the previous two talks, um, so I'm going to cut this one a little bit short given that we're also short on time. So the Wikimedia Foundation sometimes receives requests from other countries claiming that we should obey a judgment that didn't involve us at all um, or that we should apply a law that's inconsistent with US law where the foundation is based or the laws of many other countries around the world. These requests usually come from a reasonable place. The people and the countries behind the request truly believe of the value of the laws and as they should. Um, but societies around the world are different. They have different laws, they have different values, different priorities. 
I believe that we should embrace those differences rather than attempt to enforce local viewpoints on a global scale. Um, as James Forrester mentioned earlier, um, this can very easily trigger a race to the bottom and significantly impact the amount of knowledge that is out there. Um, I will kind of, I was actually gonna go into the example that Tobias had <laughs> mentioned. Um, we actually, were involved in um, that particular case in the sense that the parties demanded that we remove uh, the information from Wikipedia and also remove all of the information on the associated talk page and not at all mention the adjunction, which I'm apparently doing now. Um, we <laughs> refused on the grounds um, that the injunction didn't apply to the foundation and that the privacy issues involved there did not require the removal of the requested information. Next, another subject that you guys have been talking about quite a bit, the right to be forgotten. Um, for those of you who are not quite as familiar with it um, or just joined the discussion, the right to be forgotten broadly is the idea that one can request the removal of truthful information from search engine results due to privacy concerns and the passage of time. We believe that this concept also comes from a very good place out of a desire to safeguard the privacy of individuals. But before the right to be forgotten was in the news and making the headlines that it is these days, Wikimedians have been dealing with these kind of requests since the beginning of Wikipedia. This resulted in protective policies like the biography of living persons, neutrality, and notability, just to mention a few. As we mentioned, the right to be forgotten has only been applied against search engines to date. The Wikimedia Foundation only receives a handful of direct requests under the claim of right to be forgotten. We have denied these requests because we believe that the decision of what should and shouldn't appear on Wikipedia and other projects belongs to the community regardless of the claim, um, that whether it's defamation or whether it's right to be forgotten. This isn't to say that the right to be forgotten as a concept is wrong in any way, but the way that it is implemented is exceedingly important. Without appropriate transparency, judicial appeals methods, and strong considerations for freedom of expression, the right to be forgotten has the potential to negatively impact access to knowledge in the Wikimedia projects. An example, uh, as Lucas promised that I would give, of a right to be forgotten request that we received is, was from an individual who had a New York Times article written about him cheating in a German uh, chess tournament. He thought that since it had been a few years, he should be covered by the right to be forgotten and his name should be removed from Wikipedia. We refused it on the basis that the right to be forgotten doesn't apply to the work of the Wikimedia projects and that a case like this one wouldn't qualify for it. And as I said, it was something that we believed it belonged uh, at the hands of the community. Um, so the last topic that we wanna talk about just briefly is the issue of trademarks uh, on the projects. Uh, occasionally, the foundation does receive claims from third parties that we are somehow violating their trademarks or not using them appropriately. Uh, however, unlike a lot of these other issues, trademarks generally are just fine on Wikipedia, and that's because it is an encyclopedia that is talking about the things that are trademarked, um, and it is also being written by all of you and people all over the world, and the way that the public generally talks about a trademark might not match with what the owner of that trademark wants, but it's not prohibited by trademark law. They can't, trademark law applies to commercial uses of something, and so it often does not apply to the way that trademarks are used on the projects. Um, and an example of this uh, is one that we received earlier this year for uh, a trademark called Archery Tag. Uh, this was a company that had obtained a trademark for selling uh, foam arrows, which are used in like uh, reenactments of historical battles and role playing. Uh, and <laughs> you may have heard of this. There was also a patent dispute about it. Um, and the company claimed that we were using their trademark in a way that was not appropriately referring to their products uh, and that we were violating the law by doing so. We explained to them, first of all, that the archery and tag words by themselves were probably a very uh, limited or very weak trademark because those are both common words uh, and people can use them together uh, as just in using language. Um, but secondly, that even if they did have that archery tag trademark, the way that people were writing about it on Wikipedia to refer to different products was something that wasn't covered by trademark law. Uh, we encouraged them if they felt that it was still uh, an inaccuracy on Wikipedia to go to the community and discuss that so that we, they could make the encyclopedia more accurate. 
Uh, but once their trademark claim was not granted by the foundation, they simply chose to stop replying. <laughs> So that is everything. Thank you very much for coming and listening to our talk. Um, I believe we've actually hit the time for the break, but uh, we are happy to still continue to take questions. You can also find more information at transparency.wikimedia.org, um, and you can contact us uh, either through our emails at the foundation or on Wiki. So just as a reminder, um, our next transparency report will be released next month. Please uh, check it out. <laughs>